Tensions continue on the Ukraine-Russia border and this is the second week we are talking about it considering the amount of discussions that are taking place, considering the amount of allegations that are being thrown around, warnings of war and conflict at a very difficult time across the world. Of course, on the one hand, the president of Ukraine has met the head of NATO. He sought security assurances. He even asked for military support, which was not promised. On the other hand, Russia has made certain categorical demands of the United States and its NATO partners. We'll be talking about all this in Mapping Fault Lines. We're joined by Prabir Purkai, sir. Prabir, a lot of dramatic developments taking place over the past few days. On the one hand, the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky met Jens Stoltenberg, the head of NATO. You know, he asked for military support. While that was not promised, nonetheless, NATO has come out with a very strong statement in support of Ukraine. On the other hand, we'll come to the Russia a bit later. But how do you first see this meeting and the kind of demands Ukraine is making and what NATO is offering? You know, it's an interesting issue because if you saw, we had a Biden-Putin so-called summit that took place. That this seems to indicate nothing was resolved in that. That situation is what would be called status quo ante. And the tensions continue to mount up. Now, these are all nuclear powers, and NATO is a nuclear-armed uh, military alliance. Of course, it has three nuclear powers, but the United States is the key player over there. Now, Russia's attempt to get back to the Minsk Accords has been more or less disregarded. Neither Germany nor France, who are supposed to be the guarantors of the Minsk Accord, has really come out saying anything about it. Nor has it been accepted that that's the basis of discussion, what the state of Donbass should be as an auto autonomous region within Ukraine. But still, nevertheless, with a lot of local autonomy, that discussion hasn't taken place. So the question which Russia has posed earlier, does it mean that the NATO is going to support the, the UK, Ukraine central government marching into Donbass and then precipitating in a military uh, attack on Donbass and possible Russian intervention, therefore, is still on the table. So I think that is the key issue on which we have no clarity, that are there any guarantees that this will not happen? Is NATO trying to tell Ukraine, no, you need to really sit and resolve your internal problems? Not only they haven't said this, but they've also said that Ukraine and Georgia both will become full NATO partners right. NATO, uh, uh, within the NATO alliance, and this will depend only on the 30 countries. There is no question of Russia having any voice about it. Now, you know, if we, if we go back to the 1960s, 62, you'll remember, this was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Of course, it was true that Cuba, as an independent country, full right over what it puts on its soil, had asked Russia Soviet Union at that stage to put in nuclear batteries, nuclear missiles. That led to a near World War situation. So theoretically, it is correct to say they have the full right to put missiles on its borders. But if NATO marches to Russian borders, puts in missiles, missile batteries, and it has, as it has already done in the Baltics and a couple of other places, Romania and Poland, then doesn't it make Russia's position relatively more insecure. And having take, walked out of the intermediate range uh, treaty, ballistic missile treaty, that nuclear weapons, intermediate range nuclear weapons will not be positioned in Europe, we are back to both the intermediate range nuclear missiles being now on land and being on Russia's borders. So we now get also a certain meaning to Trump's pulling out of the Intermediate Range Missile Treaty, which is not what, what was thought that Biden would follow. But we thought that he would come back to the nuclear treaties. So that doesn't seem to have happened. And then we have more or less the NATO chief saying, we have the right to position our military, we have the right to position our forces right in Russia's borders, including missiles, including nuclear missiles. And that is really tough talk. So will that be, is that something that Russia will accept? And that's where it has said it has red lines. So I think we are poised, and I don't think the world realizes that 
wars takes place not because parties want it, but because parties put down positions that they don't want to resign from. And because of that, it can spin off into a war which nobody wanted. In this case, unfortunately, a world war can happen with nuclear weapon states in the fray, just because the Ukrainian government can, has the possibility of doing adventurist actions. And this reminds me, as I said, of the start of the First World War. Nobody wanted it. The military powers which went into the war didn't want it. It took place because of certain actions, which was, would have been considered peripheral otherwise. But given the fact that countries are toe-to-toe, -to -toe, nose to nose in a confrontation, a small little action incident can lead to a war. And as I said, in this case, talking about putting intermediate range ballistic missile, talking about NATO's you know, unfettered right to come up to Russia's borders, the, this are all positions which are it's really not simply walking back to what we call the an eastward march of NATO, but really something much more aggressive. And I think that is something we need to register, that we are talking about intermediate range ballistic missiles on the borders of Russia. These are the basic red line that Russia is now talking about that they will not accept. And what is NATO's response? To say, we have the right to do it. I think the fact that they have not promised troops, but they have put in advisors and other people on the ground over there, creates a scenario which is unstable, and we do not know what the likely dimension of this are going to be. Right. And in this context, of course, Russia has made some interesting demands as well. One of the key demands being the fact that NATO, you know, should not, for instance, incorporate Georgia and Ukraine, which NATO has promised and Stoltenberg has, I think, reiterated that. And also that it not conduct operations in the former Eastern Bloc countries. So, in some senses, Russia is asking for a return to a few decades ago to a promise which was made during the fall of the Soviet Union around that time. And we see that, uh, on the other hand, the West is in no mood to accept it at all. I, I don't think I would say they want that position to go back to what was the promise that no, not an inch further from Germany. I don't think they're asking for that. They're saying that you are conducting military hmm. uh, exercises right on our borders. This is a NATO, ex NATO set of NATO exercises which have taken place in the last few years in the territory of the Baltic states, in Romania, right. Poland, etc., etc. And if these exercises take place, normally this could be a feint to a real attack is the argument that would be made on the other side. There's no difference between an exercises and a prepar preparation to invasion as far as the other side can see. Again, nuclear powers on both sides. The second is that there are increasing cases, and again, there is a lot of US documents on this count, that both in terms of the Black Sea, naval movement in the Black Sea, coming very close to what would be called uh, Russian territory by Russia, would be called uh, captured by Russia, but Ukrainian territory by, U by US and other powers. What we are seeing is, vessels, military vessels coming very close to all of this. And that is also, again, in the current condition, really a possibility of a small incident leading to a clash. And again, with consequences which are completely unknown. So you are seeing also these kind of things also happening in air, that there are, again, this is what Russia is pointing out, air petrols which are coming very close to Russian uh, airspace. And this is a continuous development that has been taking place. So the need to at least bring down the temperature would mean that regulate all of this. Okay, we'll warn you beforehand, we will do this and not more than that. This continuous pressure of uh, air sorties and vessels coming in, along with military exercises and the threat of putting intermediate range ballistic missiles on the borders as missile batteries. I think these all put together is what Russia has taken up. Of course, when you start a discussion, you make a maximalist uh, right. claim. So that I think is what's happening. But what is interesting is that nothing has moved. We have had rounds of discussion between uh, various US and Russian officials. We have had a so-called uh, 
summit between the two and yet we see on the ground nothing seems to have changed and that's a very ominous sign that we don't seem to see from the brinkmanship any stepping back and the fact that Russia has now put some certain lines, red lines as it is called, I think makes it even more difficult because now for getting Russia to back off is also going to be difficult. So I think the unfortunately what was the situation before all of this red lines and this rhetoric is that it was possibly the uh, Biden-Putin meeting where they could have sorted some of this out and even Biden had announced there are groups which will be set up which will discuss these issues. Instead of that, all this warlike noises, starting with, of course, the, again, the renewal of the Cold War, the democracy summit, and then what we see Stoltenberg, it could not have been done without signal from President Biden. So all of this would seem to indicate we have not we are still in the same scenario we were before the summit. In fact, it would be, could be argued things have gotten a little worse. Right. And finally, probably very quickly, uh, is there a possibility for the European countries who might actually suffer, be uh, some of the worst sufferers in case, case war breaks out, taking maybe a slightly different line from the US or are their interests so closely connected with NATO that there is no differentiation at all? Well, you know, the European Union, as you said, is not only going to suffer, they are the front line of any war that takes place. If it destroys both Russia, it will also destroy parts of European Union. So I don't see why they should be towing completely the United States line. It's also interesting that if you take, for instance, the United Nations General Assembly, there is a resolution which was passed against Nazism, glorification of Nazism. It was opposed by two countries, Ukraine and the United States. That the US has been doing since 2005, so we're not so surprised about it. But a lot of the US allies in Europe, in European Union, who fought on the Soviet Union side against Nazism, have also sided by abstention. They have not voted with the glorification of Nazism being condemned, but they have also abstained. So this is the unfortunate position that the European Union and the NATO countries of Europe are, that they don't know that how to play an independent role in all of this, though if there is a battle, it's going to be fought in Europe. And if you remember, that was the reason that the Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile IRBM Treaty was, was basically in the European country's interest not to have a war with nuclear weapons on its right. soil. And the fact that the US has walked out of it was something they had opposed. But at the moment, while having made all these noises at that point of time, they don't seem to be in a, a, taking any independent position to de-escalate. And I think Angela Merkel not being there is also weakening the European diplomacy somewhat. And the fact that the, U, the European Union's economic stake mm -hmm. in the Nord Stream not getting into this kind of a military confrontation with uh, Russia, this is something that I don't really understand what is the understanding European Union has of its position. And at the moment, if they follow on the course which the United States seems to be wanting to, it will mean European Union will be economically far more dependent for energy on the United States, for example. And it will sunder the economic ties of European nations with both Russia and China. The Eurasian landmass coming together, right. that is not in the interest of the United States, but that's in the interest of European nations. So I don't know why this, this policies are not being looked at through the lens, but only being looked at through a quasi-military lens. Thank you so much, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. We'll be covering this issue in detail in the coming weeks as well. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.